I think you find that Margaret Thatcher's beliefs on most things, and I think she said this herself actually, were formed in her youth. I think she, she, her essential beliefs were there by the age of about 17, um, and that included her belief in free markets. But, and it's a very important but, I don't think she gave it a very great deal of thought in her early life. I think she worked on the assumption that a Conservative government was automatically good and a Labour government was automatically bad and she simply wished to rise in that world, in the Conservative world, which of course was in itself a great achievement because she was a lower middle class woman uh, in a, an upper class male environment. Um, and she thought it would all be all right. Um, and it was only really in her experience of the Heath government and in particular the end of the Heath government and, and the February 1974 election when these beliefs, which were always there, caught fire. Um, and she experienced a sense of the failure of the government of which she'd been a part of her, of her party and the potential failure of her country. And there's nothing she hated more than failure. And so she was able to um, weaponize her beliefs for the situation in which she found herself. <laughs> I think Mrs. Thatcher promoted the free economy first of all by talking about it. I mean, it hadn't, it had gone off the map of political discussion almost completely. Um, and with, of course, Keith Joseph, she, she brought it back with a vengeance in the mid 1970s. Uh, and I think the other thing she did, and in this respect, she was uh, much better at it than Keith Joseph, is she understood about how to talk about it in human terms. And this, in this way, she was assisted by her sex because she could say, um, women understand it, women know what happens with inflation because they have to run the domestic budget and it's the men who've blinded at you with science and got it all wrong. And so she could uh, dramatize and personalize the situation as well as having a good grasp of the, of the theory. <laughs> I think Margaret Thatcher was always um, a, a little sceptical about the European community, as it was then called. I mean, she was certainly in favour of it, um, but she, if you like, she went to church, but she didn't take communion. She didn't, she didn't um, believe in the full works, and she certainly never believed in the United States of Europe. But she saw the economic community as being, um, A, a bulwark against uh, Soviets, um, and B, as a sensible form of economic cooperation. Both of these things, of course, declined and changed um, because of alterations in history. And she got more and more, though she won some serious battles in the EC uh, about the British budget contribution, she felt afterwards she mishandled or misunderstood the negotiations about um, the Single European Act because she'd been persuaded to see it as an economic advance, which in some ways it was. But this had she kept, hadn't kept her eye on the ball about um, what it meant politically. That's to say the, the, the amount of centralizing power that it would give to Brussels. Um, and so she became more and more disillusioned and more and more furious, actually. And, and then, of course, when it all built into German reunification, end of the Cold War, and the idea that um, we had to have this single currency in order to bind in Germany, this um, all became very upsetting to her. And, and it contributed for domestic political reasons to her downfall. The first reason why Margaret Thatcher had such a big influence on Central and Eastern Europe was that she was the first uh, political leader in the West to understand, and this, this is actually, of course, why she was called the Iron Lady, because of the speech she made, and the Russians used that as they thought against her, and she grabbed it, realizing it was a compliment. When she was leader of the opposition, she made the essential new point that the people of Eastern Europe mattered. This wasn't just a matter, the Cold War was not just a matter of interstate relations. It was a matter of freedom uh, for the whole world, and particularly for the people under the uh, heel of communism. And of course, therefore, those people responded very well to that. She made a speech in Chelsea and then a speech in Kensington, which brought out these points and related them to 
why she thought détente was a bad idea because it was ill-founded in reality. Um, then, of course, when she became prime minister, she was able to uh, actually act upon these uh, principles in, that she'd articulated. And one thing she did was, first of all, to assert uh, the Western um, military power so that they could bargain from strength, uh, and then to start bargaining. You know, having refused to bargain, she then started to bargain, uh, obviously with Gorbachev. <laughs> The other thing was that she, because she was interested in the people of these countries, she always maintained a policy of seeing dissidents and speaking about dissidents in public and in her contacts with the Soviet Union. So um, Sakharov, Solzhenitsyn, uh, Bukowski. And um, this, of course, also got through. And this would also apply in the satellite states. So um, uh, problems in Poland, Czechoslovakia and so on. Um, and so for the people of Eastern Europe, here was actually someone who was speaking for them rather than just over their heads. And that, you can see that in the late Thatcher, you can see how, uh, Thatcher period, you can see how extraordinarily powerful that was with the massive response of her visits to Moscow 87, to Poland and so on. Um, huge, huge public response to her. The relationship with, between Thatcher and Reagan um, worked very well right from the start. Uh, and she was a tiny bit in advance of Reagan in the sense that she became leader of her party uh, well before he got the nomination for uh, the Republican candidacy in um, uh, 1980. She came in 75. Um, and of course, she came into office before he did, um, more than a year, a year and a half before he did. They first met when she'd just become leader and he was in the wilderness. He'd stopped being governor of California. He was trying to get the nomination for 76, which he didn't get. And they immediately clicked. And they sort of knew in advance that they would, I think, it, at least on their views. But it turned out they clicked personally as well. And um, I think that Reagan actually had a better experience than she did because of his background in the trade union, of what it's actually like to deal with communists. Um, but I think... It was tremendously encouraging for him that there was someone in Western Europe who could see all these dangers, both in Cold War terms and in economic terms. And Reagan, contrary to many critics, had a very uh, clear and thoughtful view about these issues. But it, it would be fair to say that he wasn't usually particularly good on the detail. And Mrs. Thatcher was, um, had, 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 a, had a great interest in detail as well as the big picture. And so she could sort of make precise uh, what he tended to generalise. Um, and their con contrasting temperaments and abilities work very well together. Well, the biggest specific um, policy export of Thatcherism is privatisation. Uh, which hadn't really got going. And actually, it's quite an interesting example of where Mrs. Thatcher was much more cautious than people realised, because though she'd always been in favour of privatisation in principle, she'd pretty much rejected it, except in one or two minor cases, for her first term. And it's something I try to bring out in the book, that she wasn't... She was brave, all right, but she wasn't always very bold, and she wasn't always the first in her party to, to act. For example, she was, interestingly... Though she did want to get rid of exchange controls in 1979, she needed a lot of persuading that she actually must do it now because she was very nervous. Um, so your privatisation would be a, a huge uh, export. And I think so would the freedom agenda. Um, and so also, and this again relates to her sex as well as her beliefs, is a particular model of leadership and of what women can do in the world. So I think if you put all that together, you get quite a lot of specific policy, you get quite a lot of strong uh, ideology, and you also get a sort of mythology of a personal style of leadership. It's a pretty big combination. I was 
asked to write the biography by Lady Thatcher in 1997, and it's interesting to remember now that because when I accepted, it was clearly a great opportunity and a great honour, but I was conscious that she was very out of fashion at that time. This was the early Blair, and though she still had an enormous fame and, and global reputation, people actually didn't want to think about her much in Britain. Um, and that's really, really altered since then, as was apparent in her death. Even in the hostile reactions to her, there was still this sense that you had to have this argument. Um, and I think there's a, a specific reason why it's altered as well, apart from the simple passage of time, which is that because of the credit crunch, um, the idea that everything just goes on getting better regardless, which is obviously an idiotic thing to believe about any political or economic situation, has been smashed. And Margaret Thatcher was essentially a, a great leader for bad times. She wasn't a natural leader for good times. And indeed, if we'd been in good times in the 1970s, I don't believe the Tories would ever have chosen her. And so she came to power because she could analyse a disaster and propose a solution. And um, that's what people have been looking for since 2007, 2008. So they start to think, well, what was all that about? Um, and so the reputation has changed. And though she remains intensely controversial in Britain, I would say that the reputation has uh, been enhanced uh, and that her fundamental importance uh, is now unchangeably established. I don't think, you know, people may, they, they may say she's good, they may say she's bad, but they're not going to say who was Margaret Thatcher, you know.